Welcome to the latest episode of Engineering Reimagined. I'm Kale Maestri. In this podcast series, we will explore how, like engineers, people from all walks of life are reimagining the future and their leadership roles in it. And he fails to get Dave Parker at second base, so the Oakland A's take... take I'll tell you what, we're having an earth. This was the moment that a magnitude 6.9 earthquake struck the Baseball World Series in San Francisco on October 17, 1989. It was one of the most powerful and destructive earthquakes ever to hit a populated area of the United States. In 2010, a magnitude 7 earthquake hit the island of Haiti, killing an estimated 250,000 people and displacing nearly 5 million. In 2011, New Zealand experienced its deadliest earthquake in 80 years, and that same year, a magnitude 9 earthquake hit Japan, generating a tsunami over 40 meters high. Some 15,000 deaths were recorded. In January 2018, nearly 1,000 people lost their lives after a magnitude 7.4 earthquake hit Sulawesi Island in Indonesia. With earthquake-prone cities becoming more densely populated, the role of an engineer in the aftermath of a seismic event is more important than ever. How do engineers help with the emergency response immediately after and in the weeks following a natural disaster? Cities are planning for disruption and engineers are an integral part of that plan. Carl Devereaux and John O'Hagan have known each other for many years. John is the general manager, development at Otakaro Limited and led rebuild projects following the 2011 Canterbury earthquakes, which devastated Christchurch in New Zealand. Carl is Oricon's New Zealand regional director and a member of the New Zealand urban search and rescue team. Both are structural engineers and were on the ground in the aftermath of the deadly Christchurch earthquake, where 185 people lost their lives. This insightful interview focuses on the vital role engineers play in the emergency response following an earthquake. Kia ora koutou. John, uh, welcome to Engineering Reimagined. Um, look, it's a real pleasure to be sitting down and have a chat with you today. Thanks for having me and great opportunity to be able to share stories um, and lessons that I've learned over the last you know, seven years. We've been friends for many years and we've been on a journey together since 2011 earthquakes. Uh, it's been quite a challenging time for both of us, particularly around the variety of roles that we've had in the emergency response. Following a destructive earthquake it can be really hard to make sense out of the chaos and so you landed down here um, as a volunteer um, and not a lot of people realise the critical role engineers play um, in the immediate aftermath. So what, what did that look like? Think back to those uh, early days. Um, look, it, it, it was chaos, but it was organised chaos. Um, I think it was really important uh, and I, I was able to come to that, this realisation fairly quickly that engineers were just part of a clog in a very big machine, um, but we were an extremely important clog in that machine. The information that we were gathering out in the field, building assessments, evaluations, placarding, th those kind of things, uh, was informing a much wider decision-making group. Um, it informed logistics, it informed communications, it informed the Prime Minister, um, and we were the only ones with that information. So while it appeared chaotic, and at some times we were ahead of what, the information that we were providing was well ahead of what the data entry people and the logistical people can actually, could actually cope with. Every now and again it was just a matter of pausing, letting things catch up and then recast it and go again. There's a whole lot of decision making behind that, particularly around how you prioritise uh, what you do first. So can you talk us through you know, some of that prioritisation? Where did you start with the, the initial tasks? Um, the fundamental thing is, uh, in my mind, is um, public safety. Um, it had to be you know, paramount in all the decision making. Um, so uh, uh, advising on the cordon um, and then carrying out building assessment. So we, we need to make sure, we needed to make sure that people had the confidence that the building that they were going to go back into or were working in or living in was safe for them to be there. So that, I think that kind of was the top of the pyramid, um, it was public safety. And then look, following behind that but still related to safety was making sure that um, key traffic routes in and out of the city for emergency services and those kind of things were maintained. Um, we needed to make sure that 
um, uh, horizontal infrastructure, the three waters um, particularly were up and going pretty quickly. So again, that all kind of folds back into public safety, making sure that people can um, turn on a tap and use water, can get to the hospital if they need to, and that, that the path that they, they use is safe for them to get there. So again, for me, it always went back to that. And look, I remember that from my own experience, um, yeah, that balance of safety with um, being sympathetic to people's livelihoods, the people's worlds have been turned upside down. Um, the simple act of allowing people temporary access into their home or to their workplace to recover critical items um, was actually actually so important to the recovery. Well, I think um, you know, adding to that, uh, that very point, uh, um, business continuity was a was a, a massive um, uh, driver in some of the decision making um, because of the widespread destruction in the CBD and the displacement of businesses and we knew when the quarter went up that it was going to be for some time. Uh, we couldn't have that economic flight out of Christchurch. Christchurch was just too important as a, an economic hub for New Zealand, for the South Island, to lose those businesses. So, um, you know, one of the very early tasks that we did in that first couple of weeks was escorting business owners back into the premises to get key items that they required to carry on. and. Um, and I think when we reflect back on that, we did that pretty well, um, and we didn't have that economic flight that um, other cities around the world have experienced after a, a major disaster, we were able to keep um, businesses going. One of the things that I found uh, challenging, there were many, many challenges, but one of the things I found challenging with um, uh, bringing people into the businesses and into the court and, um, was that that personal connection of their loss, um, and their loss being, you know, the displacement of the business or the disruption that they've got in their lives. Uh, I suppose I was fortunate that I came down from Wellington. Um, I didn't have any emotional ties per se to, to Christchurch. I was here to do a job, and um, you run the risk of getting too robotic with it. You know, you, you're you're protected. Protected. You're, you're outside of the public eye protected by a cordon, and so you're able to do your business. Um, when we were starting to bring people in and seeing that, um, how emotional they got when they saw their city destroyed, seeing their building and their offices um, disrupted, um, you know, that, that kind of started to play on you a bit. And, um, uh, and whether or not it was fatigue, two weeks as a volunteer, and it was full on in those, uh, in those first two days, but um, you st that, that was something that we had to manage pretty carefully within the, that, um, that response team. Well, what inspired you to become an engineer in the first place? Growing up in Wellington in the 80s, um, there was lots of holes in the ground and basements and tower cranes and construction and, and I just had a, a natural interest to it. I was drawn to the excitement and the buzz of what was happening on a building site. I didn't know what an engineer was or did. I didn't know who was involved in construction at that age. I was pretty young. Um, but I knew I had to be, have some involvement in it. I don't have an artistic bone in my body, so uh, I went down the uh, maths and physics route and uh, ended up doing engineering. Did you ever think you'd end up in the role you're currently in? No, look, uh, not at all. And I also reflect on, you know, immediately after the earthquake, when it happened and getting the phone call, I put my hand up, didn't hesitate to come down to Christchurch and, and as part of that volunteer time, but I always thought I was just going to go down have a look at some houses and then go home and you know life goes on but uh, never never imagined that um, I would have been involved in the whole um, response recovery and now into the rebuild it's um yeah, it's almost kind of every now and again you have to pinch yourself in and um, and I feel very privileged and honored to be part of it and part of it still and, and particularly the role that I've got now so yeah, mm -hmm. it's very exciting mm -hmm. um, I put my hand up and said look I'm more than happy to stay another week or two um, and so I did, I stayed on for two weeks as a volunteer. Um, and I think, you know, going back to that, would I, you know, do I, uh, did I think I'd be in the position I am now? Uh, I think it's always been that the job's just not quite finished yet, and I still wanted to be here to see it finished. And, uh, and I think, again, that, that position that I've got, I've got the opportunity to, I think it's put a full stop on the story because I will be delivering the anchor projects for Christchurch um, from that initial disaster that caused it. So you're not talking to me much at the moment about structural engineering. Um, you haven't mentioned a spreadsheet or a calculation once. Um, so tell me about some of those other aspects of the role of the engineer in, in a situation like this that are, are critical to be able to do your job. Yeah, look, I think um, uh, it has to be wind back to what we were doing. The, the, our role 
and that, and that emergence and that, that response period was um, visual assessments of buildings and damage and um, and making a call and it was an educated call based on your design experience your engineering knowledge on whether or not that visual uh, that visual damage uh, was going to put public at risk so the engineering thing was uh, you know the, the, the fundamental understanding of how a building performs uh, was critically important to getting this right. Um, and you know we were making some calls around reducing court in size, allowing people into the buildings to get um, critical business um, documents and, and computers, etc., to, to allow their continuity. But having that fundamental knowledge how a building will perform in the next aftershock was vitally important. So you're constantly planning for what might be coming uh, ahead. Yep. Now this isn't just a one-off event, it's a whole series of events and you're into a, a, a program of things that could keep ha happening. <laughs> we were reminded often when we were in buildings when aftershocks were coming through it was um, and again the decision making had to be uh, what was this building, how was this building going to perform if we got another big aftershock and um, not only were we going to be inside it we were potentially putting other people inside it as well. So you've touched on a number of challenges there in that emergency response and, and what we're talking about today is our experiences so others can learn from that. What, what would you say were sort of your most challenging um, aspects? Look I think, I think it goes back to just you need to be technically competent to be able to do that role so I think it was managing personal fatigue and, um, and when we were doing uh, the response and going around assessing buildings, we were part of a, a team, so typically a team of four. So not only, and typically the structural engineer was the, the lead in that team. So you're not only managing your own fatigue, but you're also needing to check on the fatigue of the others. So that, that, that was a challenge and we needed to get that balance right. It's very, very easy to run on adrenaline and get into that robotic kind of mode. Um, and every now and again, you need to just do that check. Look, another one was um, the, the volume of work that was, um, we were going back to that chaos, the volume of work that uh, became more and more evident the, f the longer uh, we were doing the assessments and um, so that started to get quite challenging. I don't think I could, it didn't really hit me until several months later, um, the impact on family. Um, uh, I was commuting back and forth to Wellington, um, I, I know as you were, and um, you know, young kids at the time and, and the impact on them uh, when I left the house on a Sunday and not back until Saturday morning, um, the time away from home and also the stress on you know, my wife and, and, and partners I think is also challenging because they're living it remotely and, and don't actually, they can't live and breathe exactly what you, you know, I've got control of what I'm doing. Uh, they're only kind of looking at it on TV and, and you know, the evening phone call. So, so that, was, that was challenging and I think if I was to do something again I'd probably uh, to bring them down uh, and I did eventually do that so that um, I was able to go home to some form of normality at the end of the day. So look, emergency response then transitioned into recovery um, and, we, and we had a, new, a huge challenge in Christchurch around um, this very broken city. There were still badly damaged buildings, um, there was a cordon around the CBD um, and the government came in with a new piece of legislation and set up a new agency which you became a, a key member of. Um, do you want to talk us through the, the early days of um, setting up the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority and, and what your role was in that? Yeah sure, um, so after the volunteer period I was asked to come and join the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority. We identified that the high rise buildings and the significant buildings were going to be challenging. Um, they were critically damaged and we're going to have to pull a, num a number of them down. And so, you know, me and you led a, a very good team of competent structural engineers that went around um, very systematic and, and, and the process around assessment was, um, the goal was to reduce the cordon and so we went around systematically and assessed those buildings and if they were deemed dangerous and we were given some pretty clear direction on what dangerous was defined as, uh, we were able to recommend those buildings for demolition, again going back to public safety, public good and getting the cordon reduced and, and, and being able to get recovery and rebuild going. So the roles that we had in Sierra, were, you know, there, was, there was probably two or three in, the, in, in those early days of Sierra it was carry on with the assessments and making sure that buildings came down, reviewing building demolition plans um, and overseeing the, the demolition to make sure that they were done 
safely and we, we had a pretty good track record of that. Then as Sarah developed through uh, 2012, in parallel with that, the council went out to the community with that share an idea um, about what they wanted to see in the new city. And there was an overwhelming response from the community. You know, I think it was 150, 160,000 responses. They were basically giving the decision makers and the city planners ideas of what the public, what Christchurch public wanted in their new city. So Sarah created a, a unit within the organisation, a central city um, development unit. And they were tasked with a pretty hard task of um, defining the blueprint from the, for the new city based on these share and idea opinions that were given. And they were given 100 days for that. So while I wasn't part of it, I was sitting on the outside because we needed to provide advice to that team who were developing the blueprint around buildings that were still remaining and that we weren't demolishing. Um, and they needed to understand what were the impacts were either building new buildings around those existing buildings or if we had to pull them down, what did that mean? So there was some advice that we were providing into that CCDU. Then the role for me, when the blueprint was approved and in that blueprint they had defined anchor projects, um, my role was then to um, manage the vertical builds of those anchor projects, which I did through 2012, 13, 14. So it's been quite a journey in what is a really short space of time. You landed here in 2011, uh, a volunteer, a structural engineer. Uh, you've gone through an emergency response phase into a recovery phase, demolitions then into planning the rebuild of the city and now actually being a part of leading the anchor projects and now ultimately responsible for those anchor projects. What does that feel like when you look back over five or, or six years of really busy time? Uh, you know, pretty humble for the experience. I'm now defining and helping rebuild these anchor projects and off the anchor projects become private sector developments and you know it, it is an honour to be uh, to be involved in it. And I think having a structural, near, a structural engineering um, background and training you know quite structured thinkers um, we're quite structured in our planning uh, and I think that's helped when we're looking at the quantity and quantum and value of the rebuild that we're doing I think if you look at it and say it too quickly it becomes quite overwhelming but it goes back to simple principles, you keep it simple, uh, and good planning. And I think engineers are pretty well suited to um, you know, managing some of these big projects, and, and, and in this case, the, you know, the rebuild. When we think about what uh, experiences we've had and, and how that might benefit others outside of New Zealand in particular, um, we can look back at earthquakes that have happened in San Francisco. I remember one of the early stats that we latched on to and we're looking at um, Christchurch very much in those early hours after earthquake was in San Francisco. They lost 100 buildings in their CBD and it took seven years to recover from that. Um, Christchurch lost thousands of buildings in its CBD. Um, so we naturally assumed it was going to be a much longer period to recover. Um, my personal view is that we're recovering very quickly. Um, it's hard to see that when you're here on the ground and you're amongst it, but every time a visitor comes to the city now that hasn't been here for months or, or a year or two, they're amazed by how quickly we are starting to recover. So what are some of those um, key lessons that you think in that recovery to keep the momentum behind it that other cities in the future might uh, be interested in? Yeah, look, we touched on keeping business continuity. I think that was, that was essential. And I know the central government stepped in and helped you know, with some funding to make sure businesses were able to you know, stay operational. I also think that the central government, they pumped in a lot of money, they set up the recovery acts, um, they set up organisations to be able to act really quickly. Um, so I think without that support of central government, I think the, re the rebuild and the recovery process would be a lot longer and a lot more protracted. You know, there was some pretty significant powers under that act that you know, me and you were able to make recommendations on and, and, um, and the powers that be were able to act on to be able to clear the way for these anchor projects to be, to be built. And what we're seeing, and I suppose that speed of recovery, is that private sector actually hooking off those anchor projects and developing them. And so they're doing exactly what um, the, in the intent was when the blueprint was defined and those anchor projects were landed in the locations they were landed. So, um, look, central government money, insurance, the, uh, I think that's another thing that's probably worth, worth a comment, is Christchurch was well insured, and the insurance money that came into the city helped private sector come off the back of the, 
the central government buildings. And what about the community response? We saw um, the volunteer uh, student army. Um, you talked about volunteering yourself for a number of weeks. Uh, what was the impact of those uh, early months of volunteer time and energy? Look, I think as a, from a, a community-wide response, everybody was looking after everybody. I think the, you, know, you mentioned the student army. You know, they were out there doing a huge amount of work helping neighbours, neighbours were helping each other with meals, making checking on each other. So I think there was that underlying um, desire to, to help. Uh, again, for me it was underlying desire to help and also I want to see a job finished. And, um, and I think the student army were, were, were that as well. I think they, they picked up a spade and, a, and, and wheelbarrows to clear liquefaction and they weren't going to stop until they had cleared it. And, and I think they are two examples of um, just that you know, the, the Canterbury way and people just wanting to help people. And look, I think it's a fundamental humanity thing. People just want to help. And like if I just t touch on another thing around, you know, what, what can we do globally and what can other people learn? Um, I had a fortunate um, position to go to Kathmandu after the Nepal earthquake in April and um, was able to share uh, how we responded to the earthquakes, how we evaluated buildings and how we demolished buildings safely. So there are lessons that can be had and shared and um, and it's, not, it's, it's great that we're able to kind of share those. Okay, so John, you talked about earlier becoming an engineer because you were excited about around the construction. You saw Wellington, the basements and the ground. And the 80s was the, the boom time for the construction industry, particularly in Wellington. Is that still relevant for you now and, and why you chose uh, to be an engineer? Or, or has that actually changed over time? Uh, look, I think the fundamental desire to be involved in construction is still there. I, I'm still driven by it. I love to see cranes going up and steel going up, and I still get excited at reinforcing steel. You know, it's the, those are the things that you know structural engineers love. Um, but look, my my path has changed. So I'm, I'm no longer in that te kind of technical design role. But you know, I mentioned before having that engineering background, that structured thinking, that problem solving that engineers typically have, I think has helped me in that you know, a pretty rapid career path that I've, that's happened since the earthquake to the role that I've got now. And um, uh, I also believe in the role that I've got now, um, I do believe in the, the benefits of uh, the recovery, the, the, the benefits of the, the structures that we're putting up to help communities, because these are civic assets, these are assets for the people. Um, there's no profit in any of them that we're building, these are, these are for people to come and enjoy. Um, and I believe in those objectives. I believe in the benefits that they're going to have for the wider community around health and well-being and all those kind of things. But um, so, it, you know, has it changed my why? I don't think it's changed my why, but I think it's given me a better understanding of what a building can provide, and it's a, to provide benefits for, for people. Yeah, that's great. And I'm going to take you back to one of your early points uh, where you said you chose engineering because you're good at maths and physics and you weren't creative. I would argue now, listening to your story here today, that you are quite creative and you've probably had to reimagine uh, aspects of your career along this journey. It's the creativity that will lead to some of the problem solving. What would you say to that? I think you're, look, you're right. It's, it's, um, I think if I was to answer the other question again, it would probably be, I'm probably not artistic. <laughs> but no, creative... Um, and I think you have to be creative to problem solve, and um, you know, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, we engineers are creative; we have to be. So, thank you, uh, John, for joining me here today. Uh, really appreciate your time to come in and talk about uh, the, the past few years, which have been a fantastic journey. Uh, I think you can be really proud of what you've achieved. Uh, look, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I could talk on the stuff for for days and days, but uh, yeah, there's there's so much um, to share, and um, really, thank you for for letting me this time. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Leave a review for us on iTunes or wherever you're listening. We want to know what you think. Tell a friend or colleague about us and they can find the podcast by searching Engineering Reimagined wherever they listen to podcasts.